Good, yes, good morning. Gambia, assalamu alaikum, balkonton namang lenan you and uh, grateful to be here, still standing now uh, on my feet. Um, my name is Tufa, as most of you know. And I'm grateful to have that name, because if everyone was screaming Fatu, I would be dead by now. <laughs> um, I am 23 years of age now. I reside in Toronto, Canada. I am Gambian by birth, by culture, by identity, and all that I represent. Um, I am here today not because I'm any braver than most Gambian women that have stood time and time again, changed things time and time again, took a position time and time again in their own ways, you know, within their own means and the limitations of what they can do. But I draw inspiration from Gambian women in general. So my strength is, or courage, or whatever it's called, it's no magic or no, nothing that fell from nowhere. It really does have roots from women I have looked up to. Have I taken it a step further because it's a conversation and a topic we do not want to have? Maybe. Looking into the crowd today, you know, there are so many faces in here that mean so many different things to me, obviously. But there is one face in the back. Thank you for being here. She was part of the competition too, and it means, uh, it means a lot to me. Okay, let's get to it. So in 2015, I finished Newsred Senior Secondary School. I've started attending the college first year, the higher teacher certificate. And before that, like many other Gambian girls, I have watched the Miss July 22nd pageant on TV. It's been advertised. Girls from the UTG, college, MDI, and all of the institutions participated. It wasn't a modeling or uh, the typical pageantry where we had to wear bikinis and walk on stage. It was very modest, if you will define it that way, which is very subjective, but yes. It was very much dependent on talent, display of poetry, drama, singing. And the whole purpose of joining it was to get a scholarship to go and further your education, whether it's in a university or college or just anywhere that you can in the world. So I've known many Gambian girls that would want to do that or who participated years before me. And my badge came and uh, I, I wasn't even planning it. I was walking down to college. I remember we had a presentation and a few girls walked up to me and said, Jahad and nice, and you want to represent Gambia College, be Musota win, you last rec, last rec, and you know, all those jokes. And I said, Oh, July 22nd, be Jotna. And they said, Yeah, in the next few months, and the college is participating. I told them, That's fine. So she said, Can I write your name and submit it? I told the girl, Yes. And she did. Because I forgot about it, I haven't gone for the first few weeks of training or rehearsals. I met with them again, and they told me, Nekundila Gisi. Rehearsals, B, would you like to come in and rehearse? We are having a session today. So in the evening I went. It was after lectures I went. A very nice lecturer at the college, Carol, was responsible for training us. I remember on that day they were doing rehearsals on catwalk and, and um, how to use a fork and a knife and so many other etiquettes of, of someone who would be doing a pageantry. I did that. I, I witnessed two or three rehearsals and the competition came. The, the, the system and the setup of the pageantry was there's a preliminary round where students will particip participate in their own schools to determine who will represent the school. 
and from there on, those school representatives will represent that school at the national level. So students from School of Education at the college to agriculture to nursing all participated. Another girl from School of Education came out first on that first round and I came out second, which meant me and that girl would participate at the national level. After that, we went into a hotel for a few weeks, very professional, uh, facilitated by a department from the Ministry of Education. We had mentors who helped us with our platforms and our talent displays. We did cart work, we rehearsed our routine dance and all that we were supposed to do in that hotel before the day of the competition. The competition came, 22 girls participated, all brilliant young girls from different schools all over the country. I came out as the winner and crowning happened, there were celebrations, of course, very proud in that moment. First time the Gambia College is winning the pageant. Uh, as I stood there in the moment, all I was seeing was myself in a school, studying at a university, graduating, and my mom or my dad didn't have to pay for it. I didn't have to take a loan. Proud of all the days and the work I have put into my talent display, the platform I have presented. So yes, talking, speaking in hindsight on that day was the proudest moment of my life. Went home, uh, pageant is done. There was a blueprint and a roadmap all the way to the competition. There was a, a system of knowing what to do. There's a preliminary round, there's um, uh, an organ organizers were present. They know what was going to happen after what, what was going to happen after what. The day of the competition, the location, who was going to be present, most ministers were. Um, so, so, so everyone knew what is going to happen and what is supposed to happen until after the competition. Now this is where the, the, the limbo dance is. No one is certain of what specifically is supposed to be done, what procedure should be followed immediately to get to this scholarship, the reason why we participated in the first place. It was supposed to be organized by the Ministry of Education under that department to facilitate that but when, where, and how was all up to the State House, and I guess to be specific, the President at the time. It was all up to him, it was all up to his timeline, it was all up to his arrangements. And even us meeting him was a waiting game, we had to wait. I remember us once going to a hotel because he wanted to meet us, but then he changed and we had to stay an extra day or two. Oh, right, great. So. The first time I actually met the president face to face was uh, not the formal meeting we had that was broadcasted on TV. I remember on that day I was um, around Coco Ozen. I was supposed to suit uh, a scene with um, one Nigerian actor and I was very excited for that because most of my childhood, all I have done in primary school, high school, was drama, debates. I've, I really believed that I was going to Nollywood so that was a huge dream of mine. So on that day, for the first time, having an opportunity to suit this scene with um, director Femi came to me and uh, Monica Davis was also in it, another actress that I've looked up to. That was all I wanted to do. And I remember receiving a call that the president was being awarded with full self-sufficiency and then the team had to be there in Banjul that day. And so the State House did call the girl from the Ministry of Education who was responsible for facilitating our travels if we were going to go to public events. And when she told me I didn't want to miss out on that scene because the actor was going back the next day, so there's no other opportunity, it's either I do it or someone else replaces me. I remember telling her, oh, I, I cannot come, I'm sick, you know, I, I have, I, I, I took an excuse that I was menstruating and I had cramps, so I'm not gonna come. She said, okay, but I think she relayed that back to the state house and they told her, oh no, she has to come. She is the winner. It wouldn't make sense for everyone to be here and she's not here. There was that back and forth calling, you know, and until at the end my mom was called to tell her, you know, said, don't be bugutanyo, problem, yaya jambe mo ote. 
you know. Again, to show you my naivety at the time of not understanding maybe the gravitas of Yaya Jame, thinking that I could just go on with a movie shooting and say Neko Madinho and it's fine. Because I, I was never politically survey or into discussions of Jame or what he has done or hasn't done. And I think most of us are, are in that same shoe, especially if you're just a teenager going to Newsweek High School or any other high school, you hardly get credit. And if you have credit in your phone, instead of hopping onto Freedom Radio, Fatu Network, where most of the discussions were happening outside of the country, not within, it wasn't a time and a day that you will wake up in the morning and hear your dad and your mom have conversations about someone is being killed or buried. It wasn't something you're privy to, unless you have a keen interest in it, or your family member is affected, then you tune into that. So the average Gambian teenager like me with a $25 secretic would rather hop in and look at what BNC is singing today and what Rihanna has mm -hmm. won, rather than who is being killed and buried in the Gambia. So, so in that moment at the time, I wasn't very much aware of what I could and couldn't do or what is scary or is not. I really believe that I could say that I'm not coming to a gathering and I will go ahead and suit the scene. It didn't happen that way. I wasn't in a dress, my crown was at home. There was this whole rush, my mom sent someone. Person went all the way back to Yundum, grabbed my crown, my dress, feast for the whole of Yundum village, literally. But it was just me, him, and Jimby. So we ate and then talked about this is how much it's going to cost, and he said, okay. And immediately after that, he said to me, oh, I want to marry you. So at first it hit me as a test, because this is the same man who had told me time and time again that let me not be married off, let me concentrate on my education. So for a second I thought it was a test, like, oh, the money can hall you know, to see where I'm at, or do I even have interest in him or... But as I was thinking that and laughing, like, <laughs> I looked at his face and he was dead serious because he hasn't flinched and he's, he's still waiting for an answer. I said, oh, no, I, I don't want to get married. Uh, me and your daughter, Mariam, I think we have four years between us. I've looked up to you as a father. You have advised me this entire time as a father. And even if it's not you, I do not want to get married right now in general. He looked at me, but I think more in shock, as in, oh, fogu ma dega nga ma de, but da mar kere nga halata atko. So, so to him at this point, maybe I do not understand the gravity of the blessing I'm receiving from God, and maybe I should go think about it because I'm throwing away the best thing God can ever bring to me. He said, fine, I, the car, same car took me home, I went home. I did not even think about it. Again, I, don't, I was so stupid at that age. I really thought things are not as trivial as they are. That I said, no, I don't want to get married. Life goes on. Jimmy then called again that he, she wanted to sell me something, took me to an AU villa sold me a home and a car was in it. And she told me, Lisa Bosla Moneka, Suintake Sebi. Maneko, man banyuma am kir akmoto, but Sebi part, you know, that part. You know, I, I'm not doing that part. And that was the first time she actually spoke to me and she said, you're a lot more like Jot. Do you know how many women will take this opportunity? So she was angry because at this time I was the dumbest girl on earth. And she got in her car and left and told the other driver to take me home. But when I get home at this point, I'm like, okay, this is getting a little bit too dramatic. So what I'm going to do, me, homo suma boba, thinking that man, I can just block Jimbi Jame, block whatever number she calls me, joke them college, them that I held. I really thought I could do that. 
So I blocked her, but they do have private numbers or blocked numbers as you call them in the state house. So they can call you with any number, but you can't call them back or... So I haven't called, called her, I stayed there. She called me several times in between those few weeks and she texted me and there was a time I told her I was sick, that I wasn't feeling well because I didn't want to go to the event she invited me. And she suggested that the driver will take me to a doctor to check me up or whatever is going on. Sometimes I will give that, oh, I'm traveling with my mom to Seneca. So many different excuses at so many different times. Until came June 2015, a day before Ramadan. And this part, I really do want Gambians to somehow you know, maybe step out of the political shoes or their political correctness shoes or their lack of thought for a second to just understand the, the, the cover up that is being used. A religion so important to Gambians, a religion that many have identified with Yaya Jambe found as the perfect tool to time and time again cover up the most heinous things one can do to one's body. A day before Ramadan, a night before Ramadan. Whatever, think about whatever Ramadan means to you. Jimby called me and said that there will be a Gamo Quran recitation at the State House and I should come. This was around 6, 7 in the evening. I said, okay, where are the other girls? He said, oh, they have already gone. You are late, but a car will come and pick you up to come. I said, fine. I put on my dress, a free uh, dress. I put leggings underneath it and I put a scarf over my head. Driver came landing, drove me. We got to Banjul, the first gate opened. But from the Makati Square, you can hear the, scree, the, the, the recitations, the Quran recitation, the Gamal people. And there was this group that always used to make me very happy because I always found it really interesting. It was uh, Sukula, but in Jola. And me and the girls will always repeat this um, takurim, ala takurim, takurim, marimi, something like that. And we would say this and destroy it and hammer it in the middle a thousand times, but it was that part. Whenever there was a gamo, I liked that part because I don't know what they're saying, but it just sounded really good. So I could hear it from a distance. I'm like, hey, take your takurim manakin, you know? We got into the state house, the first door opened, the, the garden was filled with ustasis in white and white gowns and women fully dressed, ready to brace the event, uh, the month of Ramadan. And Jimmy said to me that the president is coming to take a seat. So at this point, cars are not allowed to drive through, neither are people allowed to move around. So people had to s stay back and move until the president takes his seat, and then you can come and have your seat as well. Then the driver drove into the second entrance into the residence. I got off, walk up three, it's like four stairs. Jimmy told me to sit inside and wait. Once the president is seated, I will go take my seat at the rest of the gathering. I sat there with her and she said, you know, it's been a while. And I told her, yeah, we are in classes with college and all of that. Then she went out to do whatever, came back in and said, told me, let's move to the second room because there's a meeting that's coming to happen in this room. We moved to the second room and she stayed for like 10, 15 minutes and she said she was going to go and get water. She stepped out to go and get water and I was in this room by myself at this time. And as I, as I was sitting there, the president walked into that same room. 
definitely not dressed ready to go for the gamma yet he wasn't holding a Quran or the sword he has sword or whatever that thing is he ever holds he didn't have a hat on neither he's knitting garam boob it was still his under last piece of the half tan and when he walked in this time around it wasn't the Paul Jola joke it wasn't the father Figo joke it was of anger and rage and frustration at the fact that maybe I had said no too many times. He said to me, who do you think you are? That was the first thing he said to me. And for the past four years, I have been trying to answer that question, who do I think I am? And today I am here speaking to him and to Gambians because I want to tell him who I am and that I am the survivor who have come back to hunt him and men like him. That's who I am. So I hope he hears that answer for that answer that I never gave on that night. That's, that's who I am. said to me that it would have been nicer if I had just said yes. Made sure that night that I would regret why I ever said no. Pulled me into a room, used every derogatory word that you can throw at a Gambian woman. I pleaded and I begged and I screamed. And he told me not to scream because no one is gonna hear me because we could hear every word of the recitation from that room. And all those ustaz and imams were waiting for him to come out and grace their religious occasion. But he had to be himself inside first before he came out with the fake persona. I pleaded, I begged, I screamed, I said, I'm sorry a thousand times. Do not do this. I was fighting back and pulling my hands and pulling my feet, pushing him off. He will hold my dress and pull it back forward. The hardest part of my healing has been the fact that at some point in that fighting, I stopped fighting. That I gave in. I, I did gave in. I stopped fighting. I did not fight back anymore. And that has been a very hard part in my healing process. He did what he had to do. He put me on my stomach. My legs were dangling on the floor. And when I screamed that I was dying, he said to me, no, it's fun. To people that think I, wondering why am I saying this so vividly and so loud, it's because it's time that we hear this. That there are more heinous ones than this that are not being said. It's time that we all get uncomfortable because comfort has been very disastrous hearing comforting stories and comforting positions and everything is just comfort, comfort and we expect one or two girls or women to bear the burden of this discomfort and these stories whilst we all sit comfortably in our homes eating our super kanjas and because of this same comfort maybe our daughters and our sisters and our cousins are going through this but they do not even know how to start the conversation or we will just say it vaguely. The falalo hambi, the fuko pus, you know, the fuko tedokmo, the inability to differentiate between consensual sex and rape. 
our ever commitment, ready to push it under the carpet because we want to give our families dignity, we want to give our mothers dignity, we want to save the name of the family, whilst the girls are forever broken, knowing deep down within themselves that there is no dignity in living the pretentious, fake, traumatized life that they live. But as far as everyone else is comfortable, let's move on. It's not easy for me or my family or my body to put my body out there like that in all of its nature. But that is me and that is part of my story. If people have loved too far or liked too far or too far is smart, is funny, is this, is that, well, you have to accept this too far to you, this part of too far because this is part of me, it is part of my identity, my story, and my experiences, and so do other women. Sometimes we expect the perfect victims. I walked out of there broken, changed for life, reborn again. Walked out unconscious for a while, the God looked at me and told me he is the president and we will do anything to protect him. Jim B never said anything to me or talk about what had just happened. I haven't seen her since he left to go and get water. She told me I got into the back of the car. I haven't found or seen my leggings or underwear up to this date. I don't know where it is got into the back of the car, never spoke to the driver, neither did he speak to me. And we drove home. You know, everything to me felt like it was a dream or it happened five days ago. So I think my brain itself was fighting in that second to erase it, to hide it. I got home, my mom was asleep, my sister opened the door, I got into my house. I went into the shower, had the longest shower of my life thinking I could scrape off my pads, off of me or my skin, maybe his hands and his touch off of my body. Scraped, washed and scraped every inch of my body again and again and again, all by myself. You know, I speak because I have to. The, the conversation has to start somewhere. And if the highest office of this land could not protect us, because it is very acceptable and ignored in a culture and in a society where we pretend like it doesn't exist. This morning I woke up, a 13-year-old girl has been raped and the family members are saying we are going to negotiate it because it's women's bodies. Men, we have seen time and time again in different setup, setups come in and explain and narrate stories. The first question that comes to our mind is not, is it true? We talk about what happened to them. Kis nga kari bun ko dore ta stay bini. Kis nga kari bun ko lakefi. Kis nga kari bun ko def tocho eni. Yes, we discuss the torture. It's very minimal for you to hear the question of, but did the torture happen? But when women, when women come out with their stories, that is the time we are the most evident-based people. Then we want all the, we want CTV cameras, we want DNA. Lord, we want God to come down and tell us. For a culture in your we really believe in karimune karimune. 
We really do invest a lot in evidence when women speak out. And I do not blame a lot of us, men, women in this country and between cultures like this. There's not a language for this issue. It's not a conversation that we have. So people will always go to default, by default settings like, okay, but you know. Uh, We are not these people. This is not how it happened. Who is her family? Maybe the Fanyaka Khalifa, you know. They will start questioning, even talking about your looks. Look at how she looks. Any other question they can ask, even talk about the ants and elephants, rather than talk about the issue. People cannot even look at you and ask you questions about rape, because somehow it's very tabooish to even mention it. People cannot relate to a thing they do not know, both men and women. I asked my sister, and I've asked a couple of people throughout this time, how do you say rape in Mandinka? How do you say rape in Fula? How do you say rape in all our languages? And people have to think about it twice, especially the younger ones, because it is a word so hidden, so non-existent, that we do not know, and we cannot relate to things we do not know. Words like nyaping kango, words like, I, I can't even remember them. And even the ones we have are so vague, they are not specific, or they, are, they do not reflect the, 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 the heinousness of the crime itself. And I think it's time we start finding words for it, languages for it, safe spaces for women to be able to speak up. Right now, as I'm speaking to you, the consequence of speaking up, the backlash, the hate, the, the flipping of it, the trauma, the re-traumatization of not myself, but my family, you know, the accusation, just all of it, becomes more traumatizing than the event itself, than the rape itself. That culture should really question itself. But for the past four years, I have had an opportunity that many Gambian women do not have. I have gone to therapy. I have found means and ways to express my anger, to find a language, to be in my calmest moments, to expect the worst to come, to approach it with my most sincere self, to heal so much so that I can say my ordeal in pride and not in shame. But so many other people do not have that. There is not a safe space for them to say it. Our police stations are not set up in such a way that Jigen Munanyo Duga inside a police station and say, Uncle Kari, neighbor Kari, definitely, definitely. Probably police officer be knows that Uncle Kari. And they were like, Kai Fi, and them say Uncle Kari. You have police stations with three, maybe police officers standing, one brewing attire on the side, some people that have just been arrested on this side, it's all in one spot, and you expect a woman or a girl in this culture to walk into that police station and say, oh, kari rape na makari tedo na makari niakni. It's not going to happen until we create a safe space offices and spaces inside police stations with people that are professionally trained that do psychotherapy, therapy in general, or just very professional enough to be able to protect the dignity, the stories of this woman, so women can walk inside an enclosed office in dignity, explain what happened to them, and for that to be respected and due cause to be followed. Until we provide that, forget it. No girl is doing it. No lady is doing it. No one is ready to be re-traumatized a billion times again. Or people to use what happened to your body as a political tool to politicize it. It's not political. Our bodies are our bodies. Our stories are our stories. And I hope Gambian women start to take back their power, their narrative, their stories, and own the damn thing. Thank you.